last year um, I went to an 80th birthday party where my old uh, workmate Terry Patterson who comes from Great Yarmouth uh, was having his 80th birthday and we went up from Cornwall to uh, wish him well and he said why don't we um, go wh while you're up here why don't we go to the Time and Tide Museum because uh, I want to show you where my family used to live in the Rose and I said well I actually um, know a bit about Yarmouth because my mother and father both lived in, in, in Yarmouth and uh, my, my mother told me that my uh, father lived in a big house near Great Yarmouth Racecourse. So with that sort of background knowledge we went to the Time and Tide Museum and we then looked at the 1901 census and I got the shock of my life because listed in row 122 uh, <laughs> were the Chapman family and of course I'd been fed this story that they lived in a, a big house by Yarmouth Racecourse. Chance discovery about John Chapman's ancestors has thrown up a fascinating story of rags to riches. How did a family living in the rows of Great Yarmouth end up owning property in one of the most expensive areas of London? Where did the money come from? And equally as intriguing, where did it all go? At the centre of the mystery is Gladys Chapman, John's auntie, and stories of Maharajas, flashy cars and London casinos. Local historian Chris Unsworth has been researching the Chapman family story in a hope of uncovering some answers. This is where Gladys's story begins. In 1897 she was born here. It would have been very different in those days. Lots of tightly packed houses and uh, by the time she arrived her mother already had three other children. The, the, there's very little remaining of the original buildings uh, except from the south key entrance there. The rows were a network of narrow streets unique to Great Yarmouth, which ran parallel to each other and between 1890 and around 1915 the Chapman family lived here. Originally built as single family dwellings for rich merchants, the properties were later subdivided into tenements linking Great Yarmouth's three main thoroughfares. Many row houses were damaged by World War II bombing or demolished during post-war clearances. Only a handful survive today. Neighbours lived very close to each other, often raising large families in just one or two rooms. Inhabitants threw their rubbish and sewage out into the dark and dingy pathway between the houses, where it would eventually drain into the river. By around 1919, the Chapman family had moved to this house in Middlegate Street, now Tollhouse Street. The street ran through the middle of the rows, and although they hadn't moved very far, this new, larger home represented a change of fortune for the family. Amelia stayed here until 1930, when she moved to the large house by the racecourse. At some point prior to this, Gladys had moved to London. As, as far as we know, Gladys was living in London from the mid-1920s uh, up to the Second World War. But she obviously still visited her family, who by now were living in 22 North Drive, uh, the very large house where her mother and her sister and brother also lived. And it's here that the rumour is that when Gladys arrived, she would be in a large car and escorted by a Maharaja. If you assume that there was a benefactor of some sort, the, th the, the story that I was given about a Maharaja was the story that I believed and later on I have found a cutting of a, a Maharaja who had £120 million in India 
and had five Rolls Royces and goodness knows what else. And it was that sort of money that possibly could have been washing around um, for Gladys, who used it. They seem to have done quite well for themselves to get, by 1930, to 22 North Drive. Um, but whether that money came from Gladys, or came via Gladys, we, we just don't know. Uh, it's possible that it did, because certainly in the post-war years, she appears to have been a very generous aunt, um, paid for the education of various nephews, um, and, and looked after family members. My auntie Gladys uh, came down to see us in our little terraced house in, in, in Norwich, where we lived, and um, about two months after she left, um, I, I, I was going to Coleman Road uh, School um, in Norwich, and uh, the headmistress came up to me and said, there's some people interested in, in you, and you've got to take an examination. And I took, I, I took a maths exam, and I took an English exam, and I didn't really understand why. And these mysterious people who had made inquiries about my existence, <coughs> um, it, it caught my curiosity. And um, that, that was in the sort of early part of the, the school year. And then in the summer, I was told that I was going to Unthank College uh, School in Norwich, which was a private uh, school, fee paying. And I knew my mother and father didn't have any, hardly any money at all. But suddenly, after the visit of Auntie Gladys, this all came about, but I never did really know. My father never actually told me it was her who had, was paying the fees. And of course, I couldn't make two and two together, but <clears throat> that was the coincidence that first got me thinking about Auntie Gladys. Mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun. The smallest melee rabbit deplores its foolish habit. In Bengal, to move at all is seldom if ever done. But mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday, out in the midday, out in the midday, out in the midday, out in the midday. She was a striking woman. Midday, I seem to midday, think that she, she used to dye her hair. Um, sometimes it was auburn, sometimes it was sort of blondish. And she was a glamorous uh, person. And it was at the time of sort of Noel Card and this sort of film of the sort of 30s and 40s. Um, and she always conveyed the impression that she was extremely rich. Um, and she had very, very good tastes. Um, I had one or two things here, which she gave to my father. And she always had that air about her, that she was extremely um, self-assured and self-sufficient. And she liked the arts. Cathy Eden is a researcher for the Chapman family and she visited London in search of the houses where Gladys lived. But the task isn't easy. We are on St Mark's Road in Kensington. I'm trying to find um, one of the houses that Gladys lived in before she came to live in Notting Hill Gate. But um, I've walked the sort of length of this whole road and I, I just can't seem to find it. So, you know, it's a bit disappointing. And I'm trying to work out why the house isn't here anymore and I'm thinking it might have been bombed during the war and that is why it doesn't exist anymore. As, as things started to um, relax a bit in London, we, we went up there several times and, and basically for a holiday really. Um, and it was, a, it was a time when there were lots of service people about and my aunt had this, this nightclub uh, called 98 Notting Hill Gate and it was full of um, airmen and soldiers and sailors and um, 
at the end of the war, which was 46, 47, and I would be about 11 then. So it was a sort of a swinging time as far as London was concerned. They were just getting over the blitz. The house uh, was full of beautiful furniture and um, I met um, Gladys' husband who was called uh, Noble and Noble, he almost had the same illness as my father who had a, a very weak chest and um, Noble um, would go down to South Africa in the winter. Gladys insisted that for his health and I can remember that he um, he said to Gladys that he would, would like my father to come down with him. And uh, Gladys approached my mother and father and said, I think because you've got this bad chest, you ought to have the winter in South Africa. And uh, my mother wouldn't hear of it. She would not hear of, leaving, of him leaving to go to South Africa for three or four months. And uh, so he never did. But I know, he, uh, I know Noble Smith went down. Uh, so her, her name was Gladys Smith, really. And then we went, we, we went from there to um, this house, which was in uh, Camden Park Road. And then there was another one just round the corner in Bedford Gardens. And Gladys lived in Bedford Gardens and the rest of the, fam the Chapman family lived round the corner in Camden Hill Road. One house was where, my, as I say, my grandmother and father, uh, grandmother and uh, Gladys used to live. And this house here was really a nightclub as well. It had a ballroom, it had a casino, it had roulette tables, and it was quite a, a busy place. But between the two um, houses was like a courtyard. And in this courtyard, over the, 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 the cobblestones, well, there were loads and loads of weeds had grown. And when I was a lad, uh, as a, a way to get some pocket money, Gladys said to me, if you take all the weeds out, I will give you five pounds. Now, five pounds was a huge amount of money. It was the equivalent of probably a hundred pounds today. So I set to, and for two or three days, I, I got a fork and I dug up all of the weeds in the gaps in between the, the stones. And she did give me this five pounds. And then she said, would you like to play on the roulette table? Well, of course, it was, it was really exciting. As a, as a, so I said, yes, that would be great. She said, you could win some money, but on the other hand, you could lose some. And the long and the short of it was that I lost the five pounds that I'd been given by her. <laughs> <laughs> and she said to me, John, never bet if you can't afford to lose it. Never bet it if you can't afford to lose it. And I remembered that all my life. And I thought it was very hard at the time. I, I was almost crying when I lost this money. <laughs> I'm in the local study centre in the Kensington Library um, and I've just been given some um, rates books which tell me um, who was living in the property at the time that the, um, for that year and uh, who paid the bills and how much they paid for each address. Um, and it just gives me an idea of who was living where and when. It helps me sort of link up a few gaps that I've had in the research so far. I've done quite a lot of research online looking at electoral reg registers, electoral rolls, and there were a few gaps, so it's been really good to come here um, and see, you know, have, have a different source of information. Um, and I wouldn't have been able to find this information if I hadn't come here to have a look at it. So I'm really grateful that somebody has kept this, this stuff here to look at. <laughs>
But like, one or two surprises have kind of come up, which has made the day really worthwhile. And it, I don't know whether it helps at all in the research. It's more probably just sent me off looking at more things. But um, I'm really surprised to see that one of the houses had the rent, or sorry, the, the rates paid by the, um, the war department during the war years, which is a surprise because we thought it was a family home. Um, and this is the property where the family were running some kind of nightclub, as well as it being a place where they lived. So the plot thickens, you know, the mystery gets, gets bigger. So um, looking at the rate books, we were looking in particular at 93 Bedford Gardens, um, and which we thought was where our family was living. Um, for some of the years leading up to the war, it was for the family that were living there. But for some of the time, we've noticed that here we've got the name of the Secretary of State, State for War, and then later on the War Department. Yeah, the, the borough may have taken over Why some of the private houses. Right, what, what would as, they have done with um, them? Used for offices. In the war, they would have had to have um, avoided places that were likely to be bombed as right, well. And, and, might, well, yeah, yeah. and yeah. might well have had to, um, you know, sort of find other, other venues in a hurry. When I was 16, which was a, it was only, a, a, if you like, a five-year, six-year gap between me in, in London with, after the war and uh, going in, into the forces myself. I went into the police force. So uh, I went in the, after I left Unthank College, I went as a police cadet into Norfolk uh, County Constabulary. And then I went into the RAF. So I didn't really see anything of them uh, much after that. When my father died, my mother cut all ties off with, with the Chapman family. Um, she kept her own family uh, in contact with her own family and finally, in the final years of her life, went down to Plymouth and lived with her two sisters. But she never mentioned the Chapman family. And in a way, I sort of feel that she didn't approve of, of what had gone on. She didn't approve of their lifestyle. And she was a bit of a fish out of water as far as they were concerned. In its simplest terms, the, the fascination is the, the rags to riches story. How did a family who were brought up in poverty in the rows and were working as factory hands, seamstresses, how did they get the money to, but to move to a large house on the seafront here in Yarmouth and then to own large houses in one of the most expensive parts of London? Where did the money come from? How, how did they get by it? And the fact that we haven't found the answer yet just makes this whole thing more fascinating and compelling, I think. Nowadays, people could, could win the lottery. You know, there's a millionaire every week or something that comes along. But in those days, there was no way that you could, unless you inherited money, there was no way that you could actually get that sort of money. So it must have come from somewhere, and there was, there was plenty of it. Um, if you take today's value of the pro those properties, those four properties, two of which were in Kensington, uh, in some, a very good area, and Notting Hill Gate is now very upmarket as well. I, I estimate that from what I had seen of the, the places, that today it would be worth about 25 million pounds. So it, it, even in those days, it was a huge amount of money, everything's relative to, to the time. But I, I don't know what's happened to it. It's just nobody, nobody really knows. And it's a mystery. And this is the interesting thing. She, she never had any, any children of her own. Um, one of my uncles, who was called Uncle Frank, 
Um, he had a daughter who was called Julia. And I met Julia in, in London because Uncle Frank was living also at 98 Notting Hill Gate. And what he was doing in Notting Hill Gate, I, I just do not know because he was supposed to have a farm um, up at, near Magull in uh, Liverpool. And the daughter of his was uh, Julie, and she, obviously she was my cousin. So they were all living down in London as well. And then the other two, Stella and uh, Raymond, um, were, who were the children of Rose. And I can remember, I, they were called Stella and Rose Chapman. And I couldn't make out why Stella was called Stella Chapman and her mother was called Rose Chapman. And my I said to my mother at one time, why is it that my cousin is called the same surname as me? And she said, isn't it curious? Isn't it an amazing coincidence? She said, that Rose married a man by the name of Chapman. And of course I, I, I accepted it at the time, but I realized of course it was a load of lies, you know. And that's how they were. They were a bit secretive and um, didn't approve of what was going on. While it still remains a mystery as to where Gladys's money came from and went to, the research hasn't all been in vain. John has discovered cousins he didn't know he had, and earlier this year, they met for the first time. And I now have two cousins who I did not know even existed. And it's a great joy um, to, to have them, because I thought I was the only one left. <laughs> but we've got Lily and we've got Roy. But the journey that you take assumes that you are involved right through their lives. And that's an interesting thing of how this genealogy and ancestry, how it all relates. Because uh, going back to, to me, I thought that the guy I went to work with, Terry Patterson, uh, had a, a different, entirely different lifestyle when he was a boy to me. But it transpires that we were probably next door neighbours, or our family was probably next door neighbours in the rows. And when you think of the way they've gone and the way we've gone and how interesting it is, it's the social uh, activity and, and the life of people suddenly comes to life uh, in, in terms of how you see things. <laughs>